Yeah, hello, I can see the presentation, sir, right? Yeah, please stop. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Nadeem, sir, for giving me this presentation. Uh, I'm going to present on the Paris system for reporting urine cytopathology. So, uh, hello, am I audible for everybody? Yeah, yeah, clearly audible. Please go ahead. Can I have the next slide, sir? Hello. Yeah, so uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge Professor Eva Whitechick. She very generously allowed me to use her slides from the Paris classification, my colleagues at the Department of Pathology and the Department of Urology at Ames Jodhpur. Next slide, please. Before I come to the Paris classification, I would just like to tell you people about the history of urine analysis. So urine analysis, according to the Journal of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, can be considered the first laboratory test documented in the history of medicine. So you can see there is this lady standing with a round bottom flask and she's examining a pot of urine. That is, that is how we started in the medieval ages. Next slide, please. Next slide, sir. So uh, this is Ulrich Pinder's urine chart. There was something called the urine wheel, which had more than 20 odd colors of urine with which they used to uh, decipher uh, the disease. And they would say the urine was ruby red or it was, you know, like white in color. And they had different diseases associated with those uh, conditions. So just an interesting anecdote here. Uh, when doctors were diagnosing with the urine wheel, uh, taste and smell were considered as important as uh, other characteristics. And a British physician has known has been known to uh, saying the statement. He said that uh, the patients who have diabetes, their urine tastes as sweet as honey. So other pictures to show the same. Urine analysis came to symbolize the medical profession, as we can see from these paintings by Trophine and another painting in which Constantine is examining urine of African patients. So this is just to show you how we have evolved in urine analysis. So there is a soloid brand urine test case from the Welcome Collection. Uh, they have these instruments. We have an S-Bax urinometer. We have these urine tubes, different jars to measure the uh, urine physical and chemical properties. So just to give you an overview of how the urine analysis evolved. Next slide, please. So just to take an overview of the procedure, we get various types of urine samples as everybody knows. But when we talk about uh, the Paris classification, we will say that uh, we have voided urine samples. Uh, catheterized samples or bladder washes. These bladder washes are also called barbutard specimens. Uh, for voided urine, uh, not the first uh, morning sample, that is not what is important. We need to examine the second midstream urine sample from uh, patients and this is a specimen of choice in males. Uh, catheterized samples may be used in women. No fixatives are required if we are going to examine the specimens immediately. And if we anticipated delay, the specimen may be refrigerated. So next slide please, yeah. What are the various laboratory specimen preparation methods which are available? Uh, Cytocentrifugation is all of us know. Membrane filter preparation which are also called millipore and there are several monolayer or liquid based cytology preparations. Uh, in cytocentrifugation we take small aliquots of urine, we centrifuge them and concentrate the cells and examine the sediment. So, after staining them with special stains, liquid-based cytology, uh, there are uh, techniques like short path, thin prep, in which Papanicolaou staining is done. Before we uh, go on to urine examination, as for the rest of pathology, it is mandatory to have a complete history, as a uh, history of instrumentation, prior chemo and radiotherapy, all these may result in uh, cytomorphologic alterations, which may mimic malignancy. Now we will come to uh, the Paris system, which is abbreviated as TPS. 
Uh, so, what is the goal of urine cytology? Why do we need this system? Why do we need to standardize? Why Paris? Why not Bethesda? What is the guiding principle with the same? I will just touch a little bit about the cellular elements in normal urine. Types of urine specimens. What is the adequacy criteria for the same? The various diagnostic categories of TPS and any adjuvant studies, if at all. Next slide, please. So, uh, why do we do urine cytology? It is very easily available and it's a, you can take a random specimen, a voided second urine specimen. It's a non-invasive method of testing if we are talking about voided urine. It has the highest sensitivity and specificity for HGUC. Please uh, keep this in mind. It has a high sensitivity and specificity for high-grade urothelial carcinoma. And in well-differentiated bladder cancers and other causes which result in atypia, it has a relative low sensitivity. Uh, another thing which, uh, you know, results in issues in urine cytology is that we can examine only a small fraction of the urine sample. And this reduces the chance of capturing the tumor cell sometimes. The background may confound the cytology. Uh, it may obscure, we, have, we might have obscuring RBCs, WBCs, etc. And we can have criteria which are ambiguous, as we all know. So, next slide, please. So, the main purpose of the Paris classification was to detect high-grade urothelial carcinoma. This is our main concern. And this is the chief goal, to detect high-grade urothelial carcinoma. So, it is also used for follow-up in patients with a history of bladder cancer, for monitoring and surveillance of patients including after therapy. Next slide, please. Why do we need a standardized terminology? As all of us know that we had, we started with Bethesda, right? So uh, Bethesda, a classification for cervical cytology, then we moved on to Bethesda for thyroid. And we keep on updating them. So same for urine cytology. Uh, this is because we need that if I talk the, if I talk one language, somebody sitting elsewhere in the world, needs to understand that. So, improvement of communication and reproducibility. Uh, and these categories have corresponding management guidelines. There is a wide inter-observer variability as we all know. And the range of this variability varies from 2% to 30% or even more when we talk about atypia. And we know that this is not unique to cytopathology. It applies to histopathology reporting as well. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, sir? Right. So, if we need a reliable system, it has to be built based on evidence-based guidelines. It has to be inclusive, accepted by all, and it has to have clinical implications. If I say atypia, it has to be understood what I mean, right? So, this is just to let you know that when we when we talk about things like the Paris, we are actually standing on the shoulders of giants. These are some images which I have borrowed from a Memorial Sloan Kettering website. This is Leopold Kors. Anybody, so it's written here, Walenska, this is Papani Kolao. And these three people here are the cytotechnologists. This is Andrew Ritchie and this is Grace Durfee. This is Leopold Kors when he is much uh, grayer and graceful. And this is Melamed, Myron Melamed. Next slide, please. Next slide, sir. So from there, standing on the shoulders of giants, we move on to Paris. And this is the idea of developing this Paris system came in a consensus uh, meeting. at uh, There was the International Academy of Cytology Congress, which was held in Paris in 2013 May. And they had these two symposia on urine cytology. Then they said, why not? There was a lot of uh, head banging and it came through after three years as the Paris system for reporting urinary cytology. Next slide, please. So, the Paris system for urinary cytology has three chief people and they are uh, Dr. Dorothy Rosenthal from John Hopkins, Eva Wojcik from Loyola and from Wisconsin, we have Dr. Daniel. Next slide, please.
So this is uh, the outline. I would be presenting this under these headings. So what is a pathogenesis of urothelial carcinoma? This was uh, this is quite important here. What is the adequacy criteria, just like the tester? Then a few specific categories, like negative for high-grade urothelial, and so on and so forth. I'll come to these. Next slide, please. Okay, so coming to the pathogenesis of urothelial carcinoma, as all of us are aware, there are two distinct well-established pathways, and these have risk-based prognostic categories. There is one which is called the hyperplasia pathway. Next slide, sir. Hyperplasia pathway, and the second is the dysplasia pathway. So as we all know, this is just you know a recap. The hyperplasia pathway is more common. I've seen in about 80% of cases, and these are usually genetically stable. Uh, these cases start with urothelial hyperplasia and progress to low-grade urothelial cancer. In this, we have activating point mutations of FGFR3, which is nothing but uh, fibroblast growth factor receptor 3. These usually have a non-aggressive behavior, though they are known to recur. Next slide, please. Then we come to the dysplasia pathway. In the dysplasia pathway, which is less frequent, usually seen in about 15 to 20 percent of urothelial carcinomas, and they are known to be genetically unstable. They are associated with inactivating mutations of uh, p53 protein, and these start with dysplasia, and they are known to have higher grades of tumors, including muscle invasive uh, bladder cancers. So, what is the new paradigm? As I've repeatedly am saying, please remember that. Thyroid, uh, the TPS, that is the Paris classification, just like Bethesda and others, is about high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Please remember, if we remember this, we will not go wrong. There is a category called negative for high-grade urothelial carcinoma. And these are the other categories. So we have atypia, atypical urothelial cells. We have suspicious for high-grade urothelial carcinoma. And we have high-grade urothelial carcinoma. These are separated by quantity and these are separated by both qualitative and quantitative nature of the material examined. And a new category has been introduced which is LGUN, low-grade urothelial neoplasm. Next slide, please. So when we talk about uh, the guiding principle, again, repetitively, this is for the postgraduates, we want to detect and not miss any high-grade urothelial carcinomas. Negative category. So negative for high-grade urothelial carcinoma means all those categories in which we say we can attribute it to a particular condition like reactive changes, viral, cytopathic effects and features of low-grade urothelial neoplasia. So we say these are negative for high-grade urothelial carcinoma. That is the second category. And there are some cases, you know, we will not use it as a waste basket diagnosis because we definitely have we definitely have criteria. So these are those cases uh, where a definitive diagnosis cannot be made. Sometimes we are sitting on the fence. That is not the um, you know goal of this. So we say atyp atypical urothelial cells. Next slide, please. So anybody, can anybody uh, text what is the, it doesn't matter. So what is the, again, what is the guiding principle for the Paris system to difference, the difference between suspicious for high grade and high grade is quantitative as the diagnostic features are quite similar. So the number of cells allow you to definitely say whether it is high grade or just suspicious for high grade. And this new terminology called low grade urothelial neoplasia is based only on the presence of well-defined fibrovascular pores. So we have these three-dimensional fragments with very well-defined fibrovascular pores. Until and unless you do not, uh, you uh, you see these fibrovascular pores, you cannot call it LGON. Right. So as you know, uh, urine is a heterogeneous mixture of uh, several particulates. And these are namely urothelial cells, squamous epithelial cells. Some cells may come in from the prostate, some minor vesicle. You might have renal tubular epithelial cells, crystals, inflammatory cells, and cells from the neobladder or the ileal conduit. Next slide, please. So just a few, uh, as we've already covered this, what are the types of urinary specimens we get? 
uh, we get voided urine, catheterized urine, washings uh, from the uh, cystoscopy. This is called barbotage. Upper urinary tract washings when we put in a urethroscope and ideal conduit or neobladder specimens. Uh, next slide, please. So, how do we decide adequacy of the urine specimens for the diagnosis of urothelial carcinoma? As we are uh, similar to Bethesda for thyroid and cervix, this is determined by the interplay of four specimen characteristics, which are the collection type, whether it is catheterized or voided, the cellularity, what is the volume and the cytomorphologic findings. Next slide, please. So, uh, when we talk about cytomorphology, Next slide, please. We should remember that these findings should be considered first and foremost. Just like the Bethesda cervical cytology, presence of any atypical or suspicious or clear-cut malignant findings makes the specimen adequate, regardless of its cellularity, the specimen type, the volume of urine received in the laboratory. So when there are no findings indicative of, this, of such a disease process, other factors will come into play, like, as we all know, in a voided urine sample, they say a sample which is more than 30 milliliter in volume is more likely to be adequate. And similarly, when we instrument, that means in catheterized sample, we should have about two urothelial cells per 10 high power field. So this is about the adequacy of the urine specimens. Next slide, please. So just highlighting the same, this is an algorithm which says that uh, if you have atypical, suspicious or malignant cells, it automatically becomes an adequate sample. Then if you have an instrumented sample, if you have appropriate benign urothelial cellularity, it becomes adequate. And if you don't have it, that is if you don't have two urothelial cells per 10 HPF, or you have less than 2600 cells, it becomes inadequate. Similar for adequate volume, if the volume is not adequate and you don't get adequate cellularity, so you say it is inadequate. So this is just an algorithm of the adequacy of the urothelial carcinoma urine. Next slide, please. Right. So we come to the first uh, category of the Paris classification, which is negative for high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Please remember, this will include all entities which pose no significant risk to the patient. No significant risk to the patient for developing an AGUC. This is based upon several studies. So they say negative or high-grade urothelial carcinoma poses no significant risk. If you find a specific cause for a morphologic alteration in the urothelial cells, please mention negative for AGUC and don't write atypical. And these are called benign cytologic changes. For this category, we can use ancillary tests to confirm a causative agent if there is no corresponding history available. Next slide, please. So how do you define the given definition for all criteria, for all the categories? So what is the definition for NHGUC? This year, sample of urine may be considered benign or negative for high-grade urothelial carcinoma if any of the following components are present. And what are these components? You may have benign urothelial, glandular, and squamous cells. You may have benign BUTF, that is a benign urothelial tissue fragment, and sheets or clusters, especially if it is an instrumented urine. Changes associated with ethiasis, these can look quite, they can mimic malignancies. They are responsible for those AUS category. They used to be viral cytopathic effect. All of us know uh, about polyoma virus, usually BK, slash JC virus ready and post therapy effect including epithelial cells from urinary diversion in case of cystectomy patients. Next slide please. Okay, yeah. Thank you sir. So the other, uh, I've already told you we can have viral cytopathic effect unless and until they are accompanied by atypical cells they fall into N NGHUC category. Yeah, non sorry, NHGUC and post treatment effect for non-bladder disease. Unexpected normal cells like cells from the endometrium from the seminal vesicles may confound the problem further, but these have to be labeled as non uh, as negative for high grade urothelial carcinoma. I apologize for this. Next slide, please. Yeah, so just a few images to show you. Uh, it's 
pixelating for some reason. Yeah, it's okay now. So this is just to show you the urinary calculi. And this is, if you can make out, this is the, these are borrowed from uh, Dr. Eva's slide. So this is, uh, uh, you know, a specimen of a slide from a seminal vesicle. So you can see the yellowish lipofascian pigment. This is a renal tubular epithelial cast. And these are some uh, glandular cells possibly. This is uh, from a male. These are, you can see some umbrella cells here. So these are possibly some benign glandular cell. And they could not assert in the origin. Next slide, please. Right. So, I'm sure everybody can make out, just look at these elongated bacteria, some polymorphs here. Hi, uh, these are yeast forms of candida. Anybody? What are these round red inclusions in this degenerated urothelian cell? You can type out your answer. Now, next slide, please. I've shown you two of the people who were responsible for naming these lesions. These are nothing but melamed Wolinska bodies in degenerated urothelial cells. We come to the uh, next category in the benign uh, uh, cytologic findings. That is the BUTA for the benign urothelial tissue fragments in seen in instrumented urine. So, please remember these will lack the true fibrovascular cores. They do not have uh, fibrovascular cores and therefore these are true tissue fragments. Uh, typing them further depends on their uh, you know nuclear and uh, architectural details. So we say if these are benign we say these are BOTF. You can call this as non that is negative for high grade urothelial cancer and you can say BOTF. Yeah? Benign urothelial tissue fragments and or you can uh, so, this is one more category and these can be seen in, as I've already told you, in instrumentation and lithiasis of the urinary tract and usually in the renal pelvis. Next slide, please. Right. So, again, I'm reiterating urolithiasis is one of the most significant pitfalls in urinary cytopathology and the clinical history is crucial, which we often do not get. And uh, these cells can look quite ugly and leading to an overdiagnosis of atypia or, uh, you know, like suspicious. So, uh, urothelial and we all, we all know that urothelial carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma have been associated with both renal calculi or infection. Next slide, please. Uh, few other changes which occur in the category of negative for high-grade urothelial carcinoma or viral cytopathic effects. Just an interesting thing that both BK and rarely the JC virus, they take this uh, abbreviation from the initials of the patients in which they were first identified. And we know that polyoma viruses are double-stranded, non-enveloped viruses. And they have a single homogeneous basophilic inclusion. Uh, these are often called decoy cells. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, uh, where did it get this name decoy? So, there were these decoy ducks used in USA for hunting wild ducks. When the ducks would see, they, they thought these are real ducks floating, they would come and they would be captured. So, uh, the first picture that I showed. Uh, Andrew Ritchie was a cytotechnologist working in the cytology laboratory at Memorial Sloan Kettering and he gave this name of decoy cells. So a duck decoy is a man-made duck carved from wood, cork, plastic maybe, resembling a real duck used to attract ducks for in hunting. Next slide please. So uh, we are still continuing with category uh, one in the Paris that is negative for high-grade urothelial cancer. They say urothelial changes which can be attributed to treatment effects, whether it's radiation, BCG immune therapy or chemotherapy, metomycin, biotipa. All of these should be categorized not as atypical but as negative for high-grade urothelial cancer. And so as we all know, just like other systems, we have cytomegaly, we have neoplomegaly, a multinucleation, we get vacuolation in the cytoplasm and the nucleus and no overt features of uh, malignancy. We should have this history. Uh, we usually do have history of uh, radiotherapy, chemotherapy and even immune therapy. 
So please remember this should not be called as atypia. It should be all suspicious. They should be called as negative for high grade urothelial cancer. And as we know, basal calmed guarin, the immune therapy can cause granulomatous inflammation. Next slide, please. Right. So now we come to the second category, which is the uh, one which is causing a lot of uh, uh, problems. It causes pathologists to sit on the fence on their diagnosis, use it as a wastebasket terminology. Uh, just like other classification systems, this is called atypical, atypical urothelial cells or AUC. So please remember it has a strict definition uh, including urothelial cells with mild to moderate cytologic atypia. It does not include the tissue fragments without cytologic atypia. And these changes have to fall short of the diagnosis of uh, Suspicious for high grade or high grade. So next slide, please. Yeah. Next slide, please. So the definition is that we need one major criterion and one minor criterion to diagnose AUC. What is this major criterion? The major criterion says that you should have a non-degenerated urothelial cell or a non-superficial urothelial cell. Uh, with an increased NC ratio. Now, what is this increased NC ratio? They say the nucleus should be occupying more than 50% of the cytoplasm. That is, the NC ratio is more than 0.5. And only one minor criterion uh, out of three should be present. And what are those three minor criterion? You should either have nuclear hyperchromasia. And when do you call something hyperchromatic, you need to compare it with a normal cell. And what is this normal cell? It is a normal umbrella cell or, an in, or the nucleus of an intermediate squamous epithelial cell. The second minor criterion is irregular nuclear membrane rather than being smooth. It is irregularly contoured. And the chromatin is irregular, coarse and clumped. Please remember, there should be one major criterion and only one minor criterion out of these three minor criterion to call something AUC. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, can I have the next slide, please? Sir, can I have the next slide, please? Sir, can I have the next slide, please? I'm trying to change, but it is not changing. Just one second. Oh, okay. No issues. Sir. I can see the slide, but I think you can't see it. So just... Yeah, I can't see. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. I mean, the others can't see it. Otherwise, to me, it is. Uh... Just hold on. Yeah, yes, yeah, issues. There are some issues. I can teach with, I mean, I can go on if you want without. Uh... Just a minute, just a minute. Just a minute. Something, something. Sure, sir. I can see the next slide. It's not on a slide view though. I mean, if you want, I can go on from here. There's no issue. Can you see now? Yeah, I can see. I don't know if the others can see. Uh, I can't see the, I mean, you guys, what It's available. Okay. Everybody can see, right? So, 
Sure, sure. So, sir, can I have the next slide, please? It's back on this. Uh, yeah. Can I have the slide? Okay. Thank you, sir. So, as I told you, when we talk about atypical urothelial cells, sir, the slide before this, sir, when we talk about atypical urothelial cells, we have to remember that both the quality and the quantity is important for diagnosis. Uh, next slide, please. So, there are certain factors which um, obscure the uh, urine uh, cytology and you know these factors might be blood, they might be inflammatory cells, they might be a poor cellular preservation or degeneration. So in this case please do not try to give a definitive uh, category, you can just say inadequate or unsatisfactory. It's better to be prudent rather than to be sorry later. So please remember there are some times when you cannot say definitely that it's AUC or something, please carry on and say that it is inadequate or unsatisfactory. Now, uh, there is another uh, caveat to this, where there is a suspicion for high-grade urothelial carcinoma, but there is a lot of degeneration. Um, the valid choice of category would be AUC. Better to, uh, for the clinician to repeat the uh, urine uh, sample for the patient, maybe cystoscopically, maybe with a barbotage, but uh, with extensive degeneration, straight away do not call AGUC. And uh, they will not definitely categorize the number of cells which are required for atypical urothelial cells. But some studies showed that those atypical urothelial cells which uh, went on to have a negative outcome had an average of less than 9 atypical urothelial cells versus cases which had a positive outcome in terms of malignancy, they showed that there were more than 16 atypical urothelial cells present. So next slide, please. Right, this is just to show you that uh, uh, these two were, this was a specimen of uh, degenerated urothelial cells. We cannot really make out the nuclear details. They are not very crisp. And this is something that they would call atypia of um, apical urothelial cells. As we said, see, so this nucleus is much larger. Uh, these are some prominent nucleoli, but the ratio is maintained. It is not really more than 0.5 in all of them. Right. So uh, these are some examples where you just, uh, this was a degenerated urine. So just, we should lower our rate of atypical urothelial cells. Why? To gain credibility. Just, please do not use it as a wastebasket terminology. I'm reiterating. Uh, across institutes, the reporting rate of atypia ranges from as low as 2 to 31%. Despite the efforts to define this entity narrowly, like we said, one major criterion, one minor criterion, it has only fair reproducibility. And for it to be credi credible, the frequency has to be minimized. We should not call anything and everything atypical uh, urothelial cells. I've already told you that if there is something which can be attributed to a definite category, whether it is viral, cytopathic, treatment related, we should say negative for high grade urothelial cancer. So as more evidence-based data becomes available, recommendations of the frequency of AUC interpretation will evolve further. So, this is just to tell them that the risk of detecting a biopsy proven HGUC following an AUC diagnosis ranges anywhere between 3 to 34 percent. The next category is suspicious for high grade urothelial cancer. So, where there in um, atypical urothelial, we had one definite and one minor criterion. Please remember here we have two required criteria. And one of the following minor criteria needs to be present. So there the ratio was 0.5. Here they, they have said the increased NC ratio at least 0.5 to 0.7. So this is a required diagnostic criteria. The other being moderate to severe hyperchromasia. At least one of the two following features needs to be present. This is in the minor criteria. You should have irregular clumped or clumpy chromatin and markedly irregular nuclear membranes. There should be no smooth contouring of the nuclear membrane. So instead of having one definite, we have two definite here. As I've already told you, the quantity matters. When we move from AUC to NGHUC, 
to AGUC, the quantity matters. Just see, these are some uh, relatively okay looking low nuclear cytoplasmic ratio and we have these four cells here. So you can see hyperchromasia, moderate to marked hyperchromasia, nuclear membrane irregularity. And you can see that this is high NC ratio. It is definitely more than 50% of the cell area is occupied by the nucleus. Right? But they have said that if you have only these less than 5 to 10 cells in a urine sample, please don't straight away say AGUC. Say it is suspicious for high-grade urothelial cancer. Please remember quantity matters. Less than 10 cells of these kinds in a urine sample, please. Is call it suspicious for high-grade urothelial cancer. A cut-off range of 5 to 10 cells is recommended based on the degree of abnormal nuclear changes and the level of pathologist comfort. This is a nice word that they've written here. They've written depends on the experience and the level of pathologist comfort. So a positive for AGUC or a high-grade urothelial cancer diagnosis should very rarely, if ever, be given in the presence of less than five abnormal, well-preserved cells. Please remember, quantity matters. So should, for something to be HEOC, please be comfortable with more than 10 cells. In the presence of five to 10 abnormal cells, we should preferably call it suspicious for high-grade urothelial cancer. Next slide, please. Right. So, as we know, this is all done by visual inspection. This can be very subjective. So, everything else also needs to be taken into account. This being the type of the specimen, whether it is voided, whether it is barbotage, cathedralized, the clinical history of the patient, the degree of atypia uniformly across the cells. It should be that one or two cells and then you say it is eight. SHGUC, right? So it is recommended to have at least one of the abnormal cells in the specimen show all the features which were written. Next slide, please. All of this is done by eyeballing. There is no measurement here. So Zhang et al. They gave, they've given a visual analog sort of a thing and they've said this is the NC ratio. When they say Suspicious for high-grade urothelial carcinoma. So 0.5, more than 0.5 to 0.7, right? Just look at this. So 0.4 here, 0.5. So more than 0.5, we said it was AUC or atypia of uh, atypia in urothelial cells. When we come to 0.7, that is more than 70% of the cellular area is occupied by the nucleus. We are moving to the high-grade categories. Next slide, please. So we usually do this by eyeballing. We are not measuring the nuclear diameter. Uh, we come to the most important category of Paris classification, which is the AGUC. That is the high-grade urothelial cancer. Cellularity, I've already told you, at least 5 to 10 abnormal cells. Anybody will testify that these are really abnormal looking. The NC ratio needs to be more than 0.7. And the nucleus, just look. Look at the chromatin here. The, it's very hyperchromatic, very dark, compared to any, nucle any nucleus. The nuclear membrane does show some irregularities. The chromatin is coarse and clumped. Next slide, please. So, please remember, AGUC, the chief goal of the Paris classification is, next slide, please. The chief goal of the Paris classification is, to say whether something is high-grade urothelial cancer, just look at this. You can see some necrotic debris clinging to the cells, some polymorphs here. So, just like other criteria for malignancy will come into play here. Marked variation in isonucleosis, uh, varying type of cytoplasm, prominence, nucle prominence of nucleoli, atypical mitoses, necrotic debris and inflammation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So there is something called the anticipatory positive phenomenon that shows that if we are following those cases we've called positive and the period of, uh, you know, the period that we follow them for is relatively less, let's say less than six months and we do not discover a malignancy. 
it tends to underestimate the true specificity and positive predictive value of urine. So we have to realize that this has to be followed, these patients need to be followed for a longer period and this will lead to the discovery of even occult urothelial malignancy, this which is well known. And this has a very high malignant association. A positive urine cytology will be followed clinically by cystoscopy, biopsies and additional assessment of even the upper urinary tract if you don't find something in the urinary bladder per se. The other category, they have, so initially we used to say low-grade urothelial carcinoma. They've done away with this and they've replaced it with LGUN, that is low-grade urothelial neoplasm. So this is a three-dimensional cluster and they say it's, uh, you know, it's paradoxical in pathology that in uh, nowhere else in the system do we say carcinoma if it has not gone beyond the basement membrane. But in urothelium, uh, we say that. So is it truly a carcinoma? And this is not life-threatening. Next slide, please. So we, we, they've changed it and they've called it low-grade urothelial neoplasm. And they say, they say that these are three-dimensional fragments which should have a definite fibrovascular core. So look at this beautiful papillary fragment and you see a fibrovascular core here. So this is what they have chosen to call LGUN. And they have used this term for all the low-grade lesions like a urothelial papilloma, for pannum and low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma. I've already told you this, three-dimensional cellular papillary clusters and they have they show nuclear overlapping. The most important is a nice fibrovascular core with capillary should be seen in this to call it an LGUN. It's a definite category. So they have summarized all these categories and they've said, first of all, you see whether the cytologic atypia is present. If it is present, what is the degree of atypia? Is it mild? It is moderate to severe? Then you go on to the NC ratio by eyeballing method. And you see whether there are other minor criteria present, which may be hyperchromasia, a nuclear contour irregularity, that is the nuclear membrane irregularity. And you see whether the chromatin is coarse or not. Right? If you can say that there, there is mild atypia, there are reasons for mild atypia. Like we said, lithiasis might be there. There might be some viral cytopathic effects, they might be treatment related. So then you call it negative for high grade urothelial carcinoma. And if you don't have a reason for this mild atypia, you have no history, you can go on to call it AUC or atypia in urothelial cells. And when we come to the severe atypia, as I've already told you, it's the quantity of atypical cells which matters. If the number of abnormal cells is less than 5 to 10, please refrain from calling it a AGUC. You can call it a suspicious for high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Actually, clinicians will treat both of them the same way. So it really doesn't matter. But just for the reporting point of view, if it is below 5 to 10 cells, go on to call it suspicious. If it is more than 10 cells and abnormalities are seen across, please call it a Positive for high-grade urothelial cancer. Next slide, please. Right. Other malignancies are known to occur in the urinary tract. They may be primary and they may be secondary. Primary malignancies, you may get uh, adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, small cell carcinomas. And for uh, secondary neoplasm, we can have uh, prostatic carcinomas, colon carcinomas, uh, going into the urinary bladder, renal cell carcinoma shedding into the urine. Next slide, please. So, are there some ancillary studies in urinary cytology? Yes, I'm sure all of us know it by now. Uh, we have often heard and some of us are doing it. We are not doing this currently in our department. But everybody knows about Eurovision. It's a multi-probe test. And uh, CEP3, CEP7 and CEP17, we all know these are uh, centromeric enumeration probes for the alpha satellite regions. Uh, this is a locus uh, uh, satellite identifier. So this tests for all these 
uh, for its multi-probe assay. So please remember, we have Eurovision for those cases which we call atypical uh, urothelial cells. Next slide, please. So this, uh, this is just to tell you that uh, these are relatively specific for uh, molecular alterations in bladder cancer. And these avoid confounding effects of RBCs and inflammatory cells. But it also has a uh, other side to it that, you know, you BK polyoma virus and some other, if you don't have such histories, they may light up on fish. I've already told you negative for high-grade urothelial cancer, no, not required, not required in high-grade urothelial cancer. Where does it have a role to play the moment you say atypical urothelial cells? And this, as I've told you, has a wide range of reporting, actually from 2 to 30 percent. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So what is the ultimate, why do we want to categorize all this? Everything should have a clinical implication. If I say unsatisfactory or non-diagnostic, what is the risk of malignancy that I'm looking at? Or if I say high-grade urothelial cancer, just like the Bethesda for thyroid, if we say a non-diagnostic or unsatisfactory, if we say negative, it has certain risk of malignancy associated. So when we come to Let's say the atypical category, the risk of malignancy is 8 to 35 percent. And then there is a management protocol with all these patients. So there is no problem when we come to suspicious for high grade and high grade urothelial cancer. These patients will be aggressively followed up. They are, they are subjected to a cystoscopy. Uh, they, then uh, they do a TORBT or a biopsy depending on the stage at which the patient is presented and then these are sent to us for examination. So please remember for all the whole exercises because uh, all these categories have a certain risk of malignancy associated and leading to further management and they, for the patient. So it, just remember negative, the moment you say something is negative, the patient is clinically followed up until and unless the patient is not improving clinically, comes back with gross hematuria and the clinician feels that there is a need to repeat. Next slide, please. Yeah, just a few images to, uh, from uh, the cases that we report. So, can anybody type out what is this? Can anybody speak out or type out what is this? I can't hear you. So, can you, oh, excellent, Kurath. So, Kurath says it is actually a granuloma, but uh, there was something interesting in this patient. He was about, he was about 56 or 57 year old male, neutrophils in the background. We had no history whatsoever of intravesical BCG installation. We did, an, uh, we did ZN staining, as we know, zeal modified ZN staining, and we saw a lot of elongated acid fast bacilli. Uh, we went on, we went back to the clinician, we said, can this patient be worked up for immune suppression? And uh, we were not surprised when he turned out to be immunosuppressed, and he tested positive for HIV, uh, reactive for HIV. So we had. Uh, uh, please remember the source of a granuloma necessarily in urine may not be only intravesical BCG installation. Uh, we, we definitely need to keep other things in mind, however uncommon they may be. Next slide, please. This is not coming up very well, but these were elongated acid fast positive bacilli. Again, a slide to show you a degenerated urothelial cell. If you can see these uh, beautiful red inclusions, uh, inclusion like round bodies in the cytoplasm usually. These are nothing but anybody. I've already said what these are. These are Melamed Walenska bodies. So Melamed was a pathologist and Walenska was a cytotechnologist. So Myron Melamed is uh, no more. And uh, just some uh, elongated bacterial strands uh, these are yeast forms or spore forms of candida, neutrophilic infiltration. These are what we call, uh, what are these called? These we say are NHGUC, that is negative for high-grade urothelial cancer. And this we said, I mean, we call this um, uh, benign uh, tissue fragment. We, yeah, we call this a benign tissue 
fragment, but this turned out to be something else. These were, this was from a voided urine. These were unfrequent, these were infrequent, some neutrophils, a lot of blood in the background. So I'll just show you what this turned out to be. Can I have the next slide, please? Right. So another picture to show you, uh, uh, this is the same slide with the degenerated urothelial cell, a beautiful melamed Wolenska body, another urine specimen with a lot of neutrophils in the background. We, we are not doing liquid-based cytology. These are the slides which are prior to the, you know, we have now gone back and we are trying to classify our uh, urothelial um, carcinoma slides on the basis of the Paris classification, but this is prior to that. So just look at the these large clusters. Some of them contain uh, 8 to 10 cells. They are loosely cohesive. They have high NC ratio. So we call this uh, positive for high-grade urothelial cancer. I'll just show you the next slide and let you know why. We, we had some parakeratinized squamous epithelial cells. Yeah, so more images from the same case. Nobody will dispute what is this. Can you type in? Can you people type in what you think it is? So this is what we would call a tadpole cell. We've done, uh, yes, thank you. Shovik, Kurat, Nus, Nusrat, Sudar, thank you. Fiber cell or tadpole cell. So you can see that the, uh, you know, just look at this. So keratinized cells with markedly hyperchromatic a nucleus which is irregular, look at it here, and for comparison, a nice, neat squamous epithelial cell here. So we said this was possibly a high-grade urothelial carcinoma with squamous differentiation, which is known to occur in about 25% of the urothelial cancers. Next slide, please. So this is a, uh, we received the URDT for this patient, and uh, the Images are pixelating, but when we receive the TORBT, you can see that there is squamous metaplasia of the overlying neurothelium. There was an invasive tumor going much deep into the lamina propria, gone beyond the lamina propria. This was the deep muscle in the TORBT, that is the transurethral resection of the uh, bladder tumor. We can see some squamous cells going deep into the uh, muscularis propria, we can see a lot of uh, keratinization, some keratin pearls here. So this actually uh, turned out to be high-grade urothelial cancer with squamous metaplasia and extensive squamous differentiation. Uh, next slide, please. Right. So another case, uh, this, now that we go back, I, we just call these cells as atypical. We call them atypical to suspicious. We were sitting on the fence because it had a lot of neutrophilic infiltration. There were these loosely cohesive cells. Uh, did not have a lot of uh, hyperchromasia, but uh, some of them showed uh, about 70% uh, you know, uh, ratio between the nucleus and the uh, cytoplasm. So, but not much hyperchromasia. We just said atypical. And this is what it turned out to be. We had urothelium and again we had squamous differentiation of the urothelial cancer. So we missed this one. This is just to show you that uh, these are those cases which cause a lot of problem. Yeah, next slide. So another papanicolaou stain smear to uh, show you a bizarre multinucleated cell. It has uh, about um, six to seven uh, nuclei, and it had prominent chromocenters. It was hyperchromatic. We, we call this suspicious. Uh, similar picture here. We call this high-grade urothelial cancer because um, the very abnormal-looking cells, some of which were multinucleated, had high NC ratio. Next slide, please. So we had, we have. Uh, yeah, so this is for the postgraduates. Can anybody identify? You can type out your answer. I'm okay with that. So we have some, we have a cell with a high NC ratio. Yes, absolutely. Uh, no, sir, that absolutely right. It was a decoy cell, Preeti. Yes, uh, this was a case. Uh, she's a post. 
uh, renal transplant recipient and uh, so the urine showed nice decoy cells you can see a nice homogeneous intranuclear basophilic inclusion and this is a short tail almost looking like a comet so these are also called comet tail cells or decoy cells next slide please Next slide, please. So this is the case I showed you in which uh, I said on um, HNE, this is an HNE same slide. And uh, we can see, we call this uh, benign neurothelial tissue fragment. There was no fibrovascular core. And there were just only occasional fragments with these community borders, what we call papilleroid. But there was no fibrovascular core, even on going back. And this is what we got on histopathology. We had a very well-oriented, uh, uh, not very markedly dysplastic looking cells, but going quite deep into the lamina and maintaining its attachment with the uh, urothelium above. So this is the urothelium, this is the edematous lamina propria and a tumor which is actually uh, going quite deep into the lamina propria. So this is what we undercalled on cytology because we didn't see any fibrovascular pores, we didn't see much atypia, which is also seen in the corresponding histopathology section here. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this uh, was another case which came in urinary cytology. Very crazy looking cells, very high NC ratio, some sort of a molding or a windowing or whatever you uh, want to call it very neatly packed with each other. I would rather call it molding than anything else. Right? A very high NC ratio. This is pixelating, not showing here, but very hyperchromatic. As you can see here on the HE, on the preparicular staying here, very high NC ratio, very hyperchromatic. Right? Next slide, please. I want to show you the histology for this. The, though the, uh, uh, the markers for uh, a new endocrine a differentiation did not help, but the on the histology also we sh uh, we uh, we got tumor DT for this patient, and as you can see, it's a very cellular neoplasm, very cellular, and uh, cells with high NC ratio. Even at this power, which is pixelating, you can make out high NC ratio, and extensive necrosis in between a few ectatic capillaries here and there, right? So, a lot of necrosis somewhere else you would call it. What else, what would you call it on, um, let's say if you're seeing this from the lung, what would you call it? You can type, oh, yes, small cell variant, yeah. Correct, yeah. But, you know, I mean, uh, for us, as the WHO uh, 2016 says that you don't really need to prove this by IHC markers if you uh, see it on morphology, that is what we called it. We said it was a... a Carcinoma with a new endocrine differentiation. Next slide, please. So, that is the penultimate slide of the uh, session today. So, what is the take home message from all this? Uh, please don't get disheartened by the AUC category or the or missing cases. It is our, um, you know, it is a learning a ladder for us. The ultimate goal of the Paris classification is high grade urothelial carcinoma period. This is the only one that matters because it behaves very aggressively and it needs to be treated aggressively. The criteria, as I've already told you, negative for high-grade urothelial cancer includes all those categories which you can name. You may have uh, atypia due to stones, atypia due to viral inclusions, due to treatment effects. Please call them negative for high-grade urothelial carcinoma and you can classify it further. The diagnosis atopia, please do not use it to sit on the fence or as a waste basket diagnostic terminology. There are well-defined criteria, we've already covered this, one required and one minor criterion. Try to fit it into that, if it doesn't happen then we sometimes do get those problems. They've introduced a new diagnostic category which is LGUN, that is low grade urothelial neoplasia for which we definitely need a beautiful fibrovascular core in a 3D fragment. Urinary cytology cannot distinguish high-grade urothelial cancer or carcinoma in C2, which is well known to all of us. 
Not all malignant cells in urine may be from the urothelial carcinoma. They may be, as we've seen, from other secondary malignancies or the UTUC. Future studies are needed for validation of the Paris classification. So this, I just want to bring it to your attention that there is a site on Twitter for reporting they, where the American Society for Cytopathology and the International Academy, they are working together on the second edition of the Paris system. And there is an online survey for the same. So if we have queries, if we want to be heard, I would say please participate in the survey. Give your comments, go online to the Twitter site, give your comments, maybe our concerns can be addressed in this. Until unless we uh, participate, our concerns will not be heard. Next slide, please. So, uh, thank you very much for a patient hearing. And uh, thank you to one and all. Thank you, Nadeem sir, for letting me be a part of this. And I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer any queries. Uh, Kurat, you had asked that why didn't we call it a... Uh, why can't we call it... Uh, squamous cell carcinoma. We could have called it squamous cell carcinoma, but uh, it did show some areas which are typical urothelial cancer. So we prefer to call it urothelial carcinoma with squamous differentiation. Entirely, it wasn't like a pure squamous cell carcinoma. Any questions? Any questions? So I, and I apologize for one or two spell errors. Um, I think I'll go back and correct them. I didn't realize when I was typing it out. If no questions. Uh, the last case at GUC, which you said with neuroendocrine differentiation, was it called so without any supporting evidence? This is right. The so actually, uh, on cytology, we just said it's a high-grade urothelial cancer. And when it came on histopathology, we said it's a high-grade urothelial cancer with neuroendocrine differentiation. But when we did the markers subsequently, they didn't light up. So then uh, we went back to WHO, which says in 2016 that, you know, you don't really need to validate it with markers. You can straight away say that it's neuroendocrine because it looked like small cell cancer, which occurs in lung, similar. But even poorly differentiated urothelial cancer may look like that. Uh, but our markers didn't work for this case. So, you know, they didn't help. Yeah. Cytol uh, even in cytology, it showed this molding very high MC ratio, hyperchromasia. I'm not sure we saw mitoses, I, I can't recollect, but this is what it showed in cytology. Yeah. If I have uh, no questions, uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Poon, for such a wonderful presentation. Very hard work and very nicely put up. And I think most of the questions in the Paris classification is clear. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you so much, and I think we will, Thank you, sir. We will catch you again for something new. Maybe the Milan's classification next time. Right? Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.